General Principles, Criminal Law, Characteristics What are the limitations upon the power of Congress to enact penal laws? State the characteristics of criminal law and explain each. Answer to letter A. The limitations upon the power of Congress to enact penal laws are as follows. Congress cannot enact an ex post facto law. Congress cannot enact a bill of attainder. Congress cannot provide a cruel punishment. However, other limitations may be considered, like Congress cannot enact a law which shall punish for a condition, Congress shall punish an act, and not the condition or status, Robinson v. California. Congress should consider Article 21 of the Revised Penal Code, which provides that penalties that may be imposed, no felony shall be punishable by any penalty not prescribed by law prior to its commission. The characteristics of criminal law are as follows. Generality, that the law is binding upon all persons who reside to sojourn in the Philippines, irrespective of age, sex, color, creed, or personal circumstances. Territoriality, that the law is applicable to all crimes committed within the limits of Philippine territory, which includes its atmosphere, interiors, waters, and maritime zones. Prospectivity, that the law does not have any retroactive effect, except if it favors the offender unless he is a habitual delinquent, or the law otherwise provides. Article 2, if the revised penal code, however, provides for the following exemption. Treaty, stipulation, or by law, of preferential application. General principles, diplomatic immunity. The American consul accredited to the Philippines while driving his car recklessly and imprudently along Rojas Boulevard bump a pedestrian who was crossing the street and the latter died as a consequence of his injuries. Prosecuted in court for the crime of homicide through reckless imprudence, the consul claimed diplomatic immunity, alleging that he is not subject to Philippine laws and regulations. Is his defense tenable? Why? Under the principle of public international law, only sovereigns or heads of state, ambassadors, ministers, plenipotentiary, and ministers resident enjoy diplomatic immunity. Consuls do not enjoy immunity from criminal prosecution. General principles, feature of principles of criminal law. Discuss concisely the cardinal features of principles of criminal law. Give an exception to each principle and explain the same. Answer. The cardinal principles of criminal law are generality, territoriality, and prospectivity. Generality means that a penal law applies to all persons who live or sojourn in Philippine territory, subject to the principles of public international law and treaty stipulations. A penal law does not, therefore, apply to duly accredited foreign ambassadors and ministers in the Philippines, since under international law, they enjoy diplomatic immunity. Territoriality means that a penal law is enforceable within the territory of the Philippines. However, under Article 2 of the Revised Penal Code, its provisions shall be enforced outside of the jurisdiction of the Philippines against those, among others, who should commit an offense while on a Philippine ship or airship. The exception will apply if the Philippine ship or airship is registered under the laws of the Philippines. The registered Philippine ship at the time of the commission of the crime must be in in the airspace, not within the jurisdiction of a foreign country. Prospectivity means that a penal law does not have any retroactive effect, otherwise it will become an ex post facto law. However, if a penal law is favorable to the accused, it may be given retroactive effect, unless the accused is an habitual delinquent or the law otherwise expressly provides. P General principles, laws defining classes of crimes. Penal laws define distinct classes of crimes, discuss and elucidate on their distinctions. Answer. In general, penal, penal laws refer to the revised penal code and special laws. Crimes punished in the revised penal code are called felonies and those punished in special laws are called offenses. A felony, as a rule, is an act mala in se, which is wrongful from its nature, while an offense is an act mala prohibit which is a wrong only because of the law punishing it. The revised penal code also classifies felonies as intentional if dolo or malice is present and culpable if there is culpa or fault. According to gravity, felonies are grave if the penalty is capital or afflictive in any of its periods, less grave if the penalty in its maximum period is correctional, and light if the penalty is arresto minor 
or a fine not exceeding 200 or both. General Principles Schools of Thought in Criminal Law, 1996. What are the different schools of thought or theories in criminal and describe each briefly? To what theory does our revised penal code belong? Answer number one. There are two schools of thought in criminal law, and these are the classical theory, which simply means that the basis of criminal liabilities is human free will, and the purpose of the penalty is retribution, which must be proportional to the gravity of the offense, and b, the positivist theory, which considers man as a social being, and his acts are attributable not just to his will, but to other forces of society. As such, punishment is not the solution, as he is not entirely to be blamed. Law and jurisprudence should not be the yardstick in the imposition of sanction. Instead, the underlying reasons would be inquired into. Number two, we follow the classical school of thought. Although some provisions of eminently positivist in tendencies like punishment if impossible crime, juvenile circumstances are incorporated in our code. General Principles, Territoriality, Exceptions, 1982. Article 2 of the Revised Penal Code states that the provision of the said code shall be applicable to crimes committed not only within the territorial jurisdiction of the Philippines but also outside thereof. In the five instances mentioned therein, what are the underlying reasons behind or rationale for each of those five instances explained fully? Answer. The five instances provided in Article 2 of the P Revised Penal Code in which its provisions are applicable outside the territorial jurisdiction of the Philippines and the underlying reasons behind each of said instances are the following. 1. When the offender should commit an offense while on Philippine ship or airship, for this exception to apply, the Philippine ship or airship must be registered under Philippine laws. As such, it is considered an extension of Philippine territory. 2. When the offender should forge or counterfeit any coin or currency, note of the Philippines or obligations and securities issued by the government, the reason is to protect Philippine currency, notes and obligation, or securities issued by the government in order to preserve the financial credit and stability of the government. 3. When the offender should be liable for acts committed with the introduction in the Philippines or oblig of obligations and securities mentioned in paragraph 2. The reason is to protect the economic interest of the Philippines as the introduction of such forged or counterfeit obligations and securities into the country is as dangerous, if not more, as the forging or counterfeiting of the same. 4. When the offender, while being a public officer or employee, should commit an offense in the exercise of his functions, the offense committed by the public officer affects the integrity of the office and is against public administration of the Philippines. The law should follow the public officer wherever he may be. If such is not punished by the laws of the country where the public officer, officer is at the time of its commission or it is not triable by its courts, the absence of this ex exception would not make the provisions of the code applicable since the crime is committed outside of Philippine territory. 5. When the offender should commit any of the crimes against the national security of the law of nations, the reason is to safeguard the existence of the state. General Principles Territoriality 1994 Abe, married to Lisa, contracted another marriage with Connie in Singapore. Thereafter, Abe and Connie returned to the Philippines and lived as husband and wife in the home time of Abe in Calamba, Laguna. Can Abe be prosecuted for bigamy? Answer, no, Abby may not be prosecuted for bigamy since the bigamous marriage was contracted or solemnized in Singapore. Hence, such violation is not one of those where the revised penal code under Article 2 thereof may be applied extraterritorially. The general rule on territoriality of criminal law governs the situation. General principles, territoriality, generality, irrespectivity, 1998. What are the three cardinal features? or main characteristics of Philippine criminal law? Answer. The three main characteristics of Philippine criminal law are gener generality, or its being binding to all persons who live or sojourn in the Philippine territory, subject to its certain exceptions. Two, territoriality, or its having force and effect only within Philippine territory, subject to certain exceptions also. Three, irrespectivity or its application only to acts and omissions committed incurred after the effectivity of the law. General Principles Territoriality Exception 1986 Aaron is the defendant in a civil case being tried in a Manila Regional Trial Court together with his lawyer, 
Aaron went to Singapore to take the deposition of a witness who, Aaron hoped, would support his defense. The deposition was taken in a function room of the Singapore Hotel before, before Mr. Aguila, the Philippine Consul General. Neither plaintiff nor his counsel attended the proceeding. After the deposition taking, Aaron, not satisfied with the result, persuaded Aguila to make substantial cha changes in the transcript of his stenographic notes. Aaron offered $5,000 in Singaporean currency, which Aguila readily accepted. Leona, vacationing daughter of Aguila, was given $200 by Aaron when she made the alterations in the transcripts. The deponent, with neither notice nor knowledge of the alterations, signed the deposition. May Aaron Aguila and Leona be prosecuted in a Philippine court for offenses punishable under our revised penal code? What are the offenses, if any, explain? Answer. Only Aguila can be prosecuted before the Philippine court, being the Philippine Consul General in Singapore as a public officer. The provision of the revised penal code can be given extrajudicial application as the crime committed by him is related to the duties of his office. Aaron and Leona, being private persons, cannot be prosecuted before the Philippine court because regarding the offenses committed by them, the provisions of the revised penal code cannot be given extraterritorial application. Aguila committed bribery and Aaron corruption of a public officer. Leona committed falsification of a public document as a principal by direct participation and Aaron as a principal by inducement. General Principle of Territoriality Jurisdiction over Vessel 2000. After drinking one case of San Miguel beer and taking two plates of pollutant, Binoy, a Filipino seaman, stopped to the CEO Me, a Singaporean seaman, aboard MB Princess of the Pacific, an overseas vessel which was sailing in the South China Sea. The vessel, although Panamanian registered, is owned by Lushu Si, a rich Filipino businessman. When MV Princess of the Pacific reached a Philippine port at Cebu City, the captain of the vessel turned over the assailant Pinoy to the Filipino authorities. An information for homicide was filed against Pinoy in the regional trial court of Cebu City. He moved to quash the information for lack of jurisdiction. If you were the judge, will you grant the motion? Why? Answer. Yes, the motion to quash the information should be granted. The Philippine court has no jurisdiction over the crime committed since it was committed on the high seas of, or outside of Philippine territory and on board a vessel not registered or licensed in the Philippines. U.S. v. Fowler. It is the registration of the vessel in accordance with the laws of the Philippines, not the citizenship of her owner, which makes it a Philippine ship. The vessel being registered in Panama, the laws of Panama govern while it is in the high seas. Common Law Crimes 1988 Felonies Are there common law crimes in our jurisdiction? There are none. The rule is nullum crimen nulla puena sine lege. There is no crime if there is no law punishing it. Criminal intent, 1978. Is malice or criminal intent an essential requisite of all crimes? Explain. May criminal intent be presumed to exist? Discuss. Answer. Malice or criminal intent is not an essential element in all crimes. It is essential only in crimes which are mala in se. In an offense which is mala prohibita, criminal intent is not an element. Criminal intent is presumed to exist if the act is unlawful. However, in some crimes, a specific intent cannot be presumed because it is an integral element, element thereof. For example, in frustrated homicide, the specific intent to kill is not presumed. If it is not proved, the crime will not be frustrated homicide but serious physical injuries. Article 3, Dolo v. Culpa, 1978. Discuss the distinctions between Dolo and Culpa. Give an example of each. Answer. Dolo implies deliberate intent. It is equivalent to malice. Culpa means fault. That is, there is no intent or malice. The wrongful act is the result of imprudence, negligence, lack of skill, or lack of foresight. A felony is committed by means of dolo or culpa and must be voluntary. Article 3. Mala in versus Mala Prohibita. 1997. Distinguish between crimes Mala in se and crimes Mala Prohibita. May an act be Malum in se and be at the same time Malum Prohibitum? Answer. Crimes Mala in se are felonious acts committed by dolo or culpa as defined in the revised penal code. Lack of criminal intent is a valid defense, except when the crime results from criminal negligence. On the other hand, crimes mala prohibita are those considered wrong only because they are prohib prohibited by statute. They constitute violations of mere rules of convenience designed to secure a more orderly regulation 
of the affairs of society. Yes, an act may be malum in se and malum prohibitum at the same time. In People versus Sunico et al., it was held that the omission or failure of election inspectors and poll clerks to include a voter's name in the registry list of voters is wrong per se because it disenfranchises a voter of his right to vote. In this regard, it is considered as malum in se since it is punished under a special law, revised election code. It is considered malum prohibitum. Mala in se versus mala prohibite, prohibita, 2001. Briefly state what essentially distinguishes a crime mala prohibita from a crime mala in se. Crimes mala prohibita are distinguished from crimes mala in se as follows to it. In crimes mala prohibita, the acts are not by nature wrong, evil, or bad. They are punished only because there is a law prohibiting them for public good, and thus good faith or lack of criminal intent in doing the prohibited act is not a defense. In crimes mala in se, the acts are by nature wrong, evil or bad, and so generally condemned. The moral trait of the offender is involved, thus good faith or lack of criminal intent on the part of the offender is a defense, unless the crime is the result of criminal negligence. Correspondingly, modifying circumstances are considered in punishing the offender. Mala in se versus mala prohibita, 2003. Distinguish in their respective concepts and legal implications between crimes mala in se and crimes mala Ma la prohibita. In concept, crimes mala in se are those where the acts or omissions penalized are inherently bad, evil or wrong that are almost universally condemned. Crimes mala prohibita are those where the acts penalized are not inherently bad, evil or wrong, but prohibited by law for public good, public welfare, or interest, and whoever violates the prohibition are penalized. In legal implications, in crimes mala in se, good faith or lack of criminal intent, negligence is a defense, while in crimes mala prohibita, good faith or lack of criminal intent or malice is not a defense. It is enough that the prohibition was voluntarily violated. Also, criminal liability is generally incurred in crimes mala in se, even when the crime is only attempted or frustrated, while in crimes mala prohibita, criminal in liability is generally incurred only when the crime is consummated. Also, in crimes mala in se, mitigating and aggravating circumstances are appreciated in imposing the penalties, while in crimes mala prohibita, such circumstances are not appreciated unless the special law has adopted the scheme or scale of penalties under the revised penal code. Mala in se versus mala prohibita criminal intent 1988. Distinguish crime mala in se from crimes mala prohibita. May a crime be committed without criminal intent? Explain. There are three distinctions between mala in se and mala prohibita. A crime mala in se is a natural wrong. On the other hand, an offense mala prohibita is a wrong only because it is prohibited by law. In the commission of a crime mala in se, intent is an element, whereas in the commission of offense mala prohibita, criminal intent is immaterial. And crimes mala in se are punished by the revised penal code, although the revised penal code may cover special laws, while offense mala prohibita are punished by special laws. A crime may be committed without criminal intent in two cases, offense punishable as mala prohibita and felons committed by means of culpa. Mala in se versus mala prohibita, motive versus intent, 1999. Distinguish mala in se from mala prohibita, motive from intent. When is motive relevant to prove a case? When is not necessary to be established? Suggested answer. In mala in se, the acts constituting the crimes are inherently evil, bad or wrong, and hence involves the moral traits of the offender. While in mala prohibita, the acts constituting the crime are not inherently bad, evil or wrong but prohibited and made punishable only for public good, and because the moral trait of the offender is involved in mala in se, modifying circumstances, the offender's extent of participation in the crime and the degree of accomplishment of the crime are taken into account in imposing the penalty. These are not so in mala prohibita, where criminal liability arises only when the acts are consummated. Motive is a motive pa moving power which impels a person to do an act for a definite result, while intent is the purpose of using a particular means to bring about a desired result. Motive is not an element of a crime, but intent is an element of intentional crimes. Motive is attending a crime, always precede the intent. Motive is relevant to prove a case when there is doubt as to the identity of the offender or when the act committed gives rise to variant crimes and there is the need to determine the proper crime to be imputed to the offender. It is not necessary to prove motive when the offender is positively identified or the criminal act did not give rise to variant crimes. Mala prohibita or special laws generally only consummated stage punished 2000. 
Mr. Carlos Gabisi, a customs guard, and Mr. Rico Ito, a private individual, went to the office of Mr. Dieter Ocuarto, a custom broker, and represented them themselves as agents of Munglo Commercial Trading, an importer of children's clothes and toys. Mr. Gabisi and Mr. Ito engaged to prepare the file with the Bureau of Customs, the necessary import entry, and internal revenue declaration covering Munglo's shipment. Mr. Gabisi and Mr. Ito submitted to Mr. Ocuarto a packing list, a commercial invoice, a bill of lading, and a sworn import duty declaration which declared the shipments as children's toys, the taxes and duties of which were computed at 60,000 pesos. Mr. Ocuarto filed the aforementioned documents with the Manila International Container Port However, before the shipment was released, a spot check was conducted by Customs Senior Agent James Bandido, who discovered that the contents of the van shipment were not children's toys, as declared in the shipping documents, but 1,000 units of video cassette recorders with taxes and duties computed at 600,000. A hold order and warrant of seizure and detention were then issued by the District Collector of Customs. Further, investigation showed that Munglo is non-existent. Consequently, Mr. Gabisi and Mr. Ito were charged with a convicted and convicted for violation of Section 3 of RA 3019, which make it unlawful, among others, for public officer, officers to cause any undue injury to any party, including the government, in the discharge of official functions through manifest partiality, evident bad faith or gross inexcusable negligence. In their motion for reconsideration, the accused alleged that the decision was erroneous because the crime was not consummated, but was only at an attempted stage, and that, in fact, the government did not suffer any undue injury. Is the contention of both accused correct? Assuming that the attempted or frustrated stage of the violation charge is not punishable, may the accused be nevertheless convicted for an offense punished by the revised penal code under the facts of the case? Suggested answer. Letter A. Yes, the contention of the accused that the crime was not consummated is correct. RA 3019 is special law punishing acts, mala prohibita. As a rule, attempted violation of a special law is not punished. Actual injury is required. Letter B. Yes, both are liable for attempted estafa through falsification of commercial documents, a complex crime. Motive versus Intent, 1996. Distinguish intent from motive in criminal law. May crime be committed without criminal intent? Answer. Motive is the moving power which impels one to action for a definite result, whereas intent is the purpose to use a particular means to effect such result. Motive is not an essential element of a felony and need not be proved for purpose of conviction, while intent is an essential element of felonies by dolo. Yes, a crime may be committed without criminal intent, if such is a culpable felony, wherein intent is substituted by negligence or imprudence, and also in a malum prohibitum, or in an act, or if an act is punishable by special law. Motive versus Intent, 1984. Distinguish intent from motive. When does proof of motive become a crucial consideration in a criminal prosecution? What categories of crime do not require criminal intent? Answer. Furnished by Office of Justice Palma. Answer to letter A. Motive is the reason which impels one to commit an act for a definite result. Intent is the purpose to use a particular means to effect such a result. Intent is an element of a crime, whereas motive is not. B. It becomes a crucial consideration in criminal prosecution when there is doubt as to whether or not the accused committed the crime. Felonies committed by means of culpa. Offenses punishable as mala prohibita. Comments and suggested answer. Motive is the reason which impels one to commit an act for a definite result, while intent is the purpose to use a particular means to effect such a result. Motive is not an element of the crime, while intent is an element of the crime committed by dolo. Proof of motive is a crucial consideration in the criminal prosecution if there is doubt whether the accused committed the crime or not, whether the evidence on the commission of the crime is circumstantial or inconclusive, or the identity of the accused is in question. Criminal intents not required in felons committed by negligence or imprudence and in offenses which are mala prohibita. Motive versus intent, 1978. Is motive indicative of criminal intent? Is lack of motive proof of innocence? When is necessary to prove motive? 
explain your answer. Motive may be indicative of criminal intent. The fact that the accused were losing heavily in their business operations indicated the motive and therefore the intent to commit arson for the purpose of collecting the insurance of their stock of merchandise U.S. versus Gofu Sui. However, it is not sufficient to support a conviction if there is no reliable evidence from which it may deduce that the accused was the malef malefactor. People versus Marcos. People versus Martinez. Lack of motive is not necessarily proof of innocence because motive is not an essential element of the crime. A crime may be committed just for the sake of committing it to, for example, to the extreme moral per perversion of the accused, people versus Taneo. It is necessary to prove motive when the identity of the person accused of committing the crime is in dispute, people versus Del Rosario, or where there are no eyewitnesses to the crime and where suspicion is likely to fall upon a number of persons. 1996. Alexander, an escaped convict, ran amok on board a Superlines bus bound for Manila from Bicol and killed 10 persons. Terrified by the incident, Carol and Benjamin, who are passengers of the bus, jump out of the window and while lying unconscious after hitting the pavement of the road, were run over and crushed by, to death by a fast-moving desert fox bus tailing the Superlines bus. Can Alexander be held liable for the death of Carol and Benjamin, although he was completely unaware that the two jumped out of the bus? Answer, yes. Alexander can be held liable for the death of Carol and Benjamin because of felonious act of running was the proximate cause of the victim's death. The rule is that when a person by a felonious act generates in the mind of another a sense of imminent danger, prompting the latter to escape from or avoid such danger in an and in the process sustain injuries or dies, the person committing the felonious act is responsible for such injuries of death or death. 1996. Vicente hacked an acleto with a bolo, but the latter was able to parry it with his hand, causing upon him a two-inch wound on his right palm. Vicente was not able to hack an acleto further because three policemen arrived and threatened to shoot Vicente if he did not drop his bolo. Vicente was accordingly charged by the police at the prosecutor's office for attempted homicide. Twenty-five days later, while the preliminary investigation was in progress, Anacleto was rushed to the hospital because of symptoms, symptoms of tetanus infection on the two-inch wound inflicted by Vicente. Anacleto died the following day. Can Vicente be eventually charged with homicide for the death of Anacleto? Explain. Answer. Yes. Vicente may be charged of homicide for the death of Anacleto unless the tetanus infection, which developed 25 days later, was brought about by an efficient supervening cause. Vicente's felonious act of causing a two-inch wound on Anacleto's right palm may still be regarded as the proximate cause of the latter's death because without such wound, no tetanus infection could develop from the victim's right palm, and without such tetanus infection, the victim would not have died with it. 1997. While the crew of a steamer prepared to race anchor at the Pasig River, A, evidently impatient with the progress of work, began to use abusive language against the men. B, one of the members of the crew, remonstrated, saying that they could work best if they were not insulted. A, took B's attitude as a display of insubordination and Ray, rising in a range, moved towards B, wielding a big knife and threatening to stab B. At the instant, when A was only a few feet from B, the latter, apparently believing himself to be in great and imminent peril, threw himself into the water, disappeared beneath the surface, and drowned. May A be held criminally liable for the death of B? Yes. A can be held criminally liable for the death of B. Article 4 of the Revised Penal Code provides in part that criminal liability shall be incurred by any person committing a felony, although the wrongful act done be different from that which he intended, in U.S. versus Valdez, where the victim who was threatened by the accused with a knife jumped into the river, but because of the strong current or because he did not know how to swim, he drowned, the Supreme Court affirmed the conviction for homicide of the accused because if a person against whom a criminal assault is directed believes himself to be in danger of death or great bodily harm, and in order to escape jumps into the water, impelled by the instinct of self-preservation, the assailant is responsible for the homicide in case death results by drowning. 1999. 
During the robbery in a dwelling house, one of the culprits happened to fire his gun upward in the ceiling without meaning to kill anyone. The owner of the house who was hiding thereat was hit and killed as a result. The defense theorized that the killing was a mere accident and was not perpetrated in connection with or for purposes of the robbery. Will you sustain the defense? Why? No, I will not sustain the defense. The act being felonious and the proximate cause of the victim's death, the offender is liable therefore, although it may not be intended or different from what he intended. The offender shall be prosecuted for the composite crime of robbery with homicide, whether the killing was intentional or accidental as long as the killing was on occasion of the robbery. 2001. Luis Cruz was deeply hurt when his offer of love was rejected by his girlfriend Maribela one afternoon when he visited her. When he left her house, he walked as if he was sleepwalking so much so that a teenage snatcher was able to grab, grab his cell phone and flee without being chased by Luis. At the next LRT station, he boarded one of the coaches board for Baclaren. While seated, he happened to read a newspaper left on the seat and noticed that the headlines were about the sinking of the superferry while on its way to Cebu. He went over the list of missing passengers who were presumed dead and came across the name of his grandfather who had raised him from childhood after he was orphaned. He was shocked and his mind went blank for a few minutes, after which he ran amok and, using his baliso, started stabbing at the passengers who then scampered away, with three of them jumping out of the train and landing on the road below. And the three passengers died later of their injuries at the hospital. Is Louis liable for the death of the three passengers who jumped out of the moving train? State your answer. Yes, Louis is liable for their death because he was committing a felony when he started stabbing at the passengers and such wrongful act was the proximate cause of said passengers jumping out of the train, hence their death. Article 4. Revised Penal Code. Any person committing a felony shall incur criminal liability, although the wrongful act done be different from that which he intended. In this case, the death of the three passengers was a direct natural and logical consequences of Louis' felonious act, which created an immediate sense of danger in the minds of said passengers who try to avoid or escape from it by jumping out of the train. People versus ARPA. 2001. Mary Jane had two suitors, Felipe and Cesar. She did not openly show her preference, but on two occasions accepted Cesar's invitation to concerts by Regine and Pops. Felipe was a working student and could only ask Mary to see a movie which was declined. Felipe felt insulted and made plans to get even with Cesar by scaring him off somehow. One day, he entered Cesar's room in their boarding house and placed a rubber snake which appeared to be real in Cesar's backpack. Because Cesar had a weak heart, he suffered a heart attack upon opening his backpack and seeing the snake. Cesar died without regaining consciousness. The police investigation resulted in pinpointing Felipe as the culprit and he was charged with homicide for Cesar's death. In his defense, Felipe claimed that he did not know about Cesar's weak heart and that he only intended to play a practical joke on Cesar. Is Felipe liable for the death of Cesar or will his defense prosper? Why? Yes, Felipe is liable for the death of Cesar, but he shall be given the benefit of the mitigating circumstance that he did not intend to commit so great a wrong as that which was committed. Article 13, paragraph 3, RPC. When Felipe intruded into Cesar's room without the latter's consent and took liberty with the uh, latter's, latter's backpack where he placed the rubber snake, Felipe was already committing a felony and any act done by him while committing a fel felony is no less wrongful, considering that they were part of plans to get even with Cesar. Felipe's claim that he intended only to play a practical joke on Cesar does not persuade, considering that they are not friends, but in fact rivals, including Mary Jane. This case is parallel to the case of People vs. Pugay et al. Alternative answer. No, Felipe is not liable because the act of frightening another is not a crime. When he did what he did may be wrong, but not all wrongs amount to a crime, because the act which caused the death of Cesar is not a crime. No criminal liability may arise therefrom. 2003. The conduct of wife A aroused the ire of her husband B, incensed with anger almost beyond his control. B could not help but inflict physical injuries on A. Moments after B started hitting A with his fist, as A suddenly complained of severe chest pains, B, realizing that A was indeed in serious trouble, immediately brought her to the hospital. Despite efforts to alleviate A's pain, she died of heart attack. 
it turned out that she had been suffering from a lingering heart ailment. What crime, if any, could B be held guilty of? B could be held liable for parricide because his act of hitting his wife with his fist blows and therewith inflicting physical injuries on her is felonious. A person committing a felonious act incurs criminal liability, although the wrongful consequence is different from what he intended. Although A died of heart attack, the said attack was generated by B's felonious act of hitting her with his fist. Such felonious act was the immediate cause of the heart attack, having materially contributed to and hastened A's death. Even though B may have acted without intent to kill his wife, lack of such intent is of no moment when the victim dies. However, B may be may be given the mitigating circumstance of having acted without intention to commit so grave a wrong as that committed. 1976. X and Y ran amok on board a train and killed ten persons. Four persons out of fear jumped out of the train while the same was running and died. Are X and Y liable for the deaths of the four persons who jumped out of the train? X and Y are also liable for the deaths of the four persons who jumped out of the train by running amok on board the train and killing ten persons. The acts committed by X and Y are felonious and they are responsible for the direct natural and logical consequences thereof. X and Y created fear in the minds of those four persons which caused them to jump out of the running train, which resulted in their deaths. The rule is that if a man creates in another man's mind an immediate sense of danger, which causes such person to try to escape, and in so doing injures himself, the person who creates such state of mind is responsible for the injuries which result. People versus Tulling. 1994. Bay eloped with Scott, whereupon Bay's father, Robin, and brother Rustam went to Scott's house. Upon reaching the house, Rustam inquired from Scott about his sister's whereabout. While Robin shouted and threatened to kill Scott, the latter then went downstairs, but Rustam held Scott's waist. Meanwhile, Olive, the elder sister of Scott, carrying her two-month-old child, approached Rustam and Scott to pacify them. Olive attempted to remove Rustam's hand from Scott's waist, but Rustam pulled Olive's hand and causing her to fall over her baby. The baby then died moments later. Is Rustam criminally liable for the death of the child? Answer. Yes. Rustam is criminally liable for the death of the child because his felonious act was the proximate cause of such death. It was Rustam's act of pulling Olive's hand which caused the latter to fall on her baby. Had it not been for said act of Rustam, which is undoubtedly felonious, at least slight coercion, there was no cause for Olive to fall over her baby. In short, Rustam's felonious act is the cause of the evil caused. Any person performing a felonious act is criminally liable for the direct natural and logical consequences thereof, although different from what he intended. 1975. The accused ran amok aboard a moving train and killed eight persons, terrified by the happening four passengers, jumped out of the train and died as a result of their fall. Can the accused be held liable for the death of the four, although he did not even know that they jumped? Answer yes. The accused can be held liable because by riding a mock aboard the train and killing eight persons, he committed acts which are felonious. The death of the four passengers who jumped out of the train because they were terrified by the happening is the direct natural and logical consequences of running amok of the accused. Article 4. Impossible Crimes X, a domestic servant of Y, has been nurturing a grudge against him for long. One day, while Y was seated on his favorite rocking chair, X suddenly fired a volley of shots toward Y. It turned out, however, that Y has been dead for a severe stroke an hour ago. For what crime can X be held liable? Reasons. Answer. X is liable for an impossible crime of murder. The reason is the inherent impossibility of killing Y since he has been dead due to a severe stroke one hour before X shot him. The acts of execution would have been a crime against persons were it not for the inherent impossibility of his accomplishment. X, subjectively, X is a criminal, is a criminal, although objectively no crime is committed. X cannot be liable for trespass to dwelling because being a domestic servant, his entrance to the house of Y cannot be against the will of the latter. Impossible Crimes 1993 Explain and illustrate the following, Beratio Ictus, Impossible Crime, and Subornation of Perjury. Impossible Crime, Killing a Dead Person Impossible Crime 1994 JP, Aris, and Randall plan to kill Elsa, a resident of Barangay Pula. 
Laurel Batangas. They asked the assistance of Ella, who is familiar with the place. On April 3, 1992, at about 10 o'clock in the evening, J.P., Aris, and Randall, all armed with automatic weapons, went to Barangay Pula. Ella, being the guide, directed her companions to the room in the house of Elsa, whereupon J.P., Aris, and Randall fired their guns at her room. Fortunately, Elsa was not around as she had attended a prayer meeting that evening in another barangay in Laurel. J.P. et al. were charged and convicted for attempted murder by the Regional Trial Court of Tanuan, Batangas. On appeal to the Court of Appeals, all the accused ascribed to the trial court the sole error of finding them guilty of attempted murder. If you were the ponente, how will you decide the appeal? Answer. If I were the ponente, I will set aside the judgment convicting the accused of attempted murder and instead find them guilty of impossible crime under Article 4, Paragraph 2, in relation to Article 59, RPC. Liability for impossible crimes arises not only when the impossible le impossibility is legal, but likewise when it is factual or physical impossibility, as in the case at bar, Elsa's absent from the house is a physical impossibility which renders the crime intended inherently incapable of accomplishment. To convict the accused of attempted murder would make Article 4, Paragraph 2 practically useless as all circumstances which prevented the consummation of the offense will be treated as an incident independent of the actor's will, which is an element of attempted or frustrated felony. In Tud v. C.A. Article 4, Impossible Crimes, 1998 Buddy always resented his classmate June. One day, Buddy planned to kill June by mixing poison in his lunch. Not knowing where he can get poison, he approached another classmate, Jerry, to whom he disclosed his evil plan. Because he himself harbored resentment towards June, Jerry gave Buddy a poison which Buddy placed on June's food. However, June did not die because unknown to both Buddy and Jerry, the poison was actually powdered milk. What crime or crimes, if any, did Jerry and Buddy commit? Suppose that because of his severe allergy to powdered milk, June had to be hospitalized for 10 days for ingesting it. Would your answer to the first question be the same? Answer. Jerry and Buddy are liable the, for the so-called impossible crime because with intent to kill, they try to poison June and thus perpetrate murder. A crime against person, June was not poisoned only because the would-be killers were unaware that what they mixed with the food of June was powdered milk, not poison. In short, the act done with criminal intent by Jerry and Buddy would have been constituted a crime against person were it not for the inherent inefficacy of the means employed. Criminal liability is incurred by them although no crime resulted because their act of trying to poison June is criminal. Number two, no, the answer would not be the same as above. Jerry and Buddy would be liable instead of less serious physical injuries for causing the hospitalization and medical attendance for 10 days to June. Their act of mixing with the food eaten by June, the matter which required such medical attendance, committed with criminal intent, renders them liable for the resulting injury. Impossible Crime 2000 What is an impossible crime? Is an impossible crime really a crime? C. A, B, C and D are armed with arm lights proceeded to the house of X. Y. A neighbor of X who happened to be passing by pointed to the four culprits, the room that X occupied. The four culprits peppered the room with bullets. Unsatisfied, A even threw a hand grenade that totally destroyed X's room. However, unknown to the four culprits, X was not inside the room and nobody was hit or injured during the incident. Are A, B, C, and D liable for, the, for any crime? Explain. D. Carla, four years old, was kidnapped by Enrique, the tricycle driver paid by her parents to bring and fetch her to and from school. Enrique wrote a ransom note demanding 500000 from Carla's parents in exchange for Carla's freedom. Enrique sent the ransom note by mail. However, before the ransom note was received by Carla's parents, Enrique's hideout was discovered by the police. Carla was rescued while Enrique was arrested and incarcerated. Considering that the ransom note was not received by Carla's parents, the investigating prosecutor merely file a case of impossible crime to commit kidnapping against Enrique. Is the prosecutor correct? Sud suggested answer to letter A. An impossible crime is an act which would be an offense against person or property, were it not for the inherent impossibility of its accomplishment or on account of the employment of inadequate or ineffectual means. Article 4, Paragraph 2, RPC B. No, an impossible crime is not really a crime. It is only so-called because the act gives right to criminal liability, but actually no felony is committed. The accused is to be punished for his criminal tendency or propensity, although no crime was committed. C. 
Yes, A, B, C, and D are liable for destructive arson because of the destruction of the room of X with the use, with the use of an explosive, the hand grenade. Liability for an impossible crime is to be imposed only if the act committed would not constitute any other crime under the revised penal code, although the facts involved are parallel to the case of Intuit versus Court of Appeals, where it was ruled that the liability of the offender was for an impossible crime. No hand grenade was used in said case, which constitutes a more serious crime, though different from what was intended. D. No, the prosecutor is not correct in filing a case for impossible crime to commit kidnapping against Enrique. Impossible crimes are limited only to acts which, when performed, would be a crime against persons or property, as kidnapping is a crime against personal security and not against person or property. Enrique could not have incurred an impossible crime to commit kidnapping. There is thus no impossible crime of kidnapping. The Systems, 2003. A and B, both store janitors, plan to kill their employer C at midnight and take the money kept in the cash register. A and B together drew the sketch of the store where they knew C would be sleeping and planned the sequence of their attack. Shortly before midnight, A and B were ready to carry out the plan. When A was about to lift C's mosquito net to trust his dagger, a police car with the sirens blaring passed by. Scared, B ran out of the store and fled, while A went on and stabbed C to death put the money in his bag, and ran outside to look for B. The latter was nowhere in sight, unknown to B. B had already left in the place. What was the participation and corresponding criminal liability of each, if any, reason? There was an express conspiracy between A and B to kill C and take the latter's money. The planned killing and taking of the money appears to be intimately related as component crimes, hence a special complex crime of robbery with homicide. The conspiracy being expressed, not just implied, A and B are bound as co-conspirators after they have planned and agreed on the sequence of their attack even before they committed the crime. Therefore, the principle in, in law that when there is a conspiracy, the act of one is the act of all, already governs them. In fact, A and B were already in the store to carry out their criminal plan. That B ran out of the store and fled upon hearing the sirens of the police car is not spontaneous desistance, but flight to evade apprehension. It would be different if Baden tried to stop A from continuing with the commission of the crime. He did not. So, the act of A in pursuing the commission of the crime, which both he and B designed, planned, and commenced to commit, would also be the act of B because of their express conspiracy. Both are liable for the composite crime of robbery with homicide. Alternative answer. A shall incur full criminal liability for the crime of robbery with homicide, but B shall not incur criminal liability because he desisted. B's spontaneous desistance made before all acts of execution are performed is exculpatory. Conspiracy to rob and kill is not per se punishable. The resistance need not be actuated by remorse or good motive. It is enough that the discontinuance comes from the person who has begun the commission of the crime, but before all acts of execution are performed. A person who has begun the commission of a crime but desisted is absolved from criminal liability as a reward to one who, having set foot on the verge of crime, heeds the call of his conscience and returns to the path of righteousness. 1976 stage of execution ex a physician wanted to kill his wife he gave her food with poison after eating the food the wife became unconscious bothered by his own conscience ex gave her medicine to counteract the effects of the poison and the wife was saved ex is prosecuted for frustrated parasite is he guilty of the charge reason ex is not liable for frustrated parasite although he has already performed all the acts of execution to kill his wife because she ate the food with poison which he gave her she however did not die due to the, to med due to the medicine which he administered after she became unconscious and because his conscience bothered him the death of the wife therefore did not result due to a cause which depended upon the voluntary will of x in a frustrated felony the offender performs all the acts of execution which would produce the felony as a consequence but which nevertheless do not produce it by reason of causes or of causes independent of the will of the perpetrator stage of execution desistance 1985 intending to kill his estranged wife mirna antony mixed poison in her coffee which would have normally killed her after drinking the coffee mirna felt nauseated and vomited appalled 
by the suffering and helplessness of his wife, Antony took pity on her and gave her an antidote. Myrna recovered completely after ten days. Discuss with reason the criminal liability of any of Antony. May he invoke desistance in this favor? An answer, Antony will not be liable for preceded parricide. Although the wife, Myrna, had drunk the poisoned coffee and all the acts of execution to kill, were already committed she did not however die due to the antidote administered by antony their crime was therefore not produced due to the voluntary act of antony in a frustrated felony the acts of execution have been performed which would produce the felony as a consequence but nevertheless do not produce it by causes independent of the will of the offender so if the perpetrator himself prevented the consummation of the crime, it is not frustrated. In that sense, when Antony gave the antidote to his wife, when he saw her suffering after drinking the poisoned coffee, such act may be considered desistance in killing her, although as a rule, desistance refers to acts of execution. The facts of the problem merely state that after the administration of the antidote, the wife recovered after ten days. It may be presumed that she was ill during that period. Since there is no mention of medical attendance nor incapacity from work, the offense will be slight physical injuries under paragraph 2 of Article 260 of the Revised Penal Code. Stage of Execution Homicide, 1979. X and Y had a heated altercation and then exchanged blows. X pulled out a knife and stabbed Y in the abdomen. Y ran away, but before he could reach his house was struck by lightning and died. The fiscal filed homicide against X decide. X is not liable for homicide, but for the crime constituting the stabbing of Y in the abdomen. Since the injury was mortal, the liability of X is for frustrated homicide. The death of the victim was caused by the lightning which struck him. Although a felony was committed by X, such was not the direct and proximate cause of the death of Y. The lightning was an efficient intervening cause, People versus Rockwell. The rationale of the rule is that the cause of the cause is the cause of the evil caused. People versus Ural. Stage of execution when punishable, 1977. Acting under the impulse of hunger, Jose tried to steal the two pesos bill in the breast pocket of a stranger, but before he could get the money, he was seen and eventually apprehended by a policeman. Later on, Jose was charged of the light offense of attempted theft for two pesos. Was Jose correctly charged, considering that light offenses are punishable only when consummated? Answer. Jose was correctly charged for a light felony of attempted, attempted theft of two pesos because theft is a crime against property and is punishable even though it is not consummated. 1988 Light Felonies When are light felonies punishable and who are liable in light felonies? Light felonies, according to Article 7 of the Revised Penal Code, are punishable only when they have been consummated, with the exception of this com committed against person or property. Article 16 of the Revised Penal Code provides that the following are criminally liable for light felonies. Principles, accomplices, conspiracy, 1976, X, Y, and Z fired their guns almost simultaneously at the principal victim, resulting in his death and his driver. Is there conspiracy among the accused in the commission of the crime? Reason. There is no, there is conspiracy among the accused X, Y, and Z. The fact that the three fired almost simultaneously at the principal victim shows that they have acted in concert pursuant to a common criminal objective. There is, therefore, a unity of action and intention, people versus San Luis. To establish conspiracy, proof of previous agreement is not necessary. It is enough that if at the time of the commission of the crime, all the accused have the same purpose and were united in its execution, people versus Binasi. 1997 1977, conspiracy, when L, a notorious robber in the neighborhood, was apprehended by an irate crowd and while L was being held from behind by M, N stoned L, hitting him on the head. O hit him on the knee with a piece of food and P stabbed him on the chest. Which stabbing was the cause of the death of L? Said acts were committed almost simultaneously to the surprise of M. What criminal liability, if any, was incurred by M N O P recently? M has no criminal liability for what N O P did because their acts surprised him and hence M was not aware of what they would have done. The criminal li liability of N O N P is individual and not collective. The facts of the problem show that these offenders did not act concertedly in pursuance of common purpose. They had no knowledge of each other's criminal intent. 
there is no unity of action and intention to hold that the act of one is the act of all. Mere simultaneousness of acts does not of itself indicate concurrence of will, nor the unity of action and purpose, which are the basis of the opportunity of two or more persons, people versus Ibanez. Conspiracy, 1980. H made a bet of 10 pesos with I in a game of Beto Beto. H won, but I refused to pay the amount. A dispute arose between them, which culminated in a fist fight. J, the father of H, and K, the brother of H, intervened. When the fight began, H held the hand of I. J seized the front part of I's shirt, and while they were dealing blows at one another, K came with a balisong and stabbed I, inflicting upon him a mortal wound. H, J, and K were charged with homicide. Is it proper to hold all the accused responsible for the fatal wound inflicted upon the victim by K? It is not proper to hold H and J liable for the fatal wound inflicted upon the victim by K because of the absence of conspiracy. He and J are not co-principals of K in the killing of the victim. The liability of H, J, and K is not collective but individual. They have not acted conceitedly for the realization of a common criminal objective. H and J who dealt blows on the victim without causing any physical injury could be liable for ill treatment. 1998 Conspiracy At a pre-wedding celebration where plenty of people were smiling and walking about or standing close together, a mad killer shot up the wedding party. The three appellants were convicted by the court as co-conspirators of the killer because they were allegedly with him before, during, and after the shooting. It was proven conclusively that the appellant were friends of the killer that they went together with the killer to the celebration and that they left at the same time with the killer after the shooting. However, the appellants had no guns and possibly witnessed the shooting without intervening in the killing in any way nor shielding killer. Is there conspiracy among them? There is no conspiracy among them because of the, as the problem has stated, they possibly witnessed the shooting. No overt acts was committed, therefore the elements that the conspiracy must be proved as the essence of the crime itself is not present. Conspiracy 1990 Aki and Ben, while walking together, met Kaloy. There was an altercation between Ben and Kaloy so that Ben chased and stabbed Kaloy with a knife, hitting his right arm, thereby causing slight physical injuries. Ben desisted from further assaulting Kaloy, but Aki lunged at Kaloy and felled him this time with a bolo which mortally wounded Kaloy. Thus, he died. What is the criminal liability of Aki? How about of Ben? Explain. Assuming conspiracy is established, will your answer in problem A be the same? Aki is liable for homicide because while it is clear that he intentionally caused the death of Kaloy, none of the circumstances attendant to murder are present. Intent to kill is clear as Aki launched at Kaloy after the latter was inflicted a wound at the right arm and gave him a mortal wound. Ben is guilty only of slight physical injuries as it is evident from the wound he inflicted upon Kaloy that he did not intend to kill the latter. Also there was no other act on the part of Ben to show such intent. B. No. There being no conspiracy, each will be liable for their own individual act. This time, both will be liable for homicide because in conspiracy, the act of one is the act of all, people versus Damasco. Conspiracy 1991 During a fiesta, Simon Marco, brandishing a knife, asked Constancio whether he was the one who slapped his son the year previous. Vicentes, Vicente, father of Constancio, shouted at Constancio and his other son, Win Benito, telling them to run away. When Win Benito passed by Rafael Marco, brother of Simon, Rafael stabbed him. When Benito parried the blow but fell down, his feet entangled with some vines. While Win Benito was lying on the ground, Rafael continued to stab him, inflicting slight injuries on the shoulder of Win Benito, after which Rafael stood up. At that moment, Dulcissimo Beltran, no relation to the Marco brothers, came out of nowhere and together with Simon stabbed Ben Benito. Both of them inflicted fatal wounds, resulting in the death of the victim. Discuss the criminal liability of Dulcissimo, Simon, and Rafael. B. Supposing Dulcissimo is a convict out of parole, will the aggravating circumstances of quasi-recidivism be appreciated against him? Answer. 
A. Simone and Dulcissimo will be liable for the death of Benvenido as the fatal injuries sustained by the victim were inflicted by the two. Raphael is not liable for slight physical injuries as conspiracy was not present and there was no apparent intent to kill when he inflicted the slight physical injuries on the arm of the victim. Alternative answer. Dulcissimo, Ray, Simone, and Raphael will all be liable under the principle of conspiracy, where the act of one becomes the act of all. Conspiracy, 1992. As Sergio, Yonyong, Soilo, and Warlito engage in a drinking spree at Parth Prop Disco, Special Police Officer 3, SPO 3, Manolo Yabang, suddenly approached them, aimed his revolver at Sergio, whom he recognized as a wanted killer, and fatally shot the latter, whereupon Yoyong, Soilo, and Warlito ganged up on Yabang. Warlito, using his own pistol, shot and wounded Yabang. What are the criminal liabilities of Yoyong, Soilo, and Warlito for the injury to Yabang? Was there conspiracy and treachery? Explain. In turn, is Yabang criminally liable for the death of Sergio? Answer. If they have to be criminally liable at all, each will be responsible for their individual acts as there appears to be no conspiracy, as the acts of the three were spontaneous and a reflex response to Yabang's shooting of Sergio. There was no concerted act that will lead to a common purpose. Conspiracy 1993 As a result of a misunderstanding during a meeting, Joey was mauled by Nestor, Dolan, Redden, and Arthur. He ran toward his house, but the four chased and caught him. Thereafter, they tied Jose's hands at his back and attacked him. Nestor used a knife, Dolan a shovel, Arthur his fist, and Redden a piece of wood. After killing Joey, Redden ordered the digging of a grave by to, bur to bury Joey's lifeless body. Thereafter, the four left together. Convicted by the killing of Joey, Arthur now claims that his conviction is erroneous that it was he who inflicted the fatal blow. Would you sustain his claim? Why? What was the crime committed by the four assailants? Discuss with reason. Number one. No, Arthur's claim is what without merit. The offenders acted in conspiracy in killing the victim and hence liable collectively. The act of one is the act of all. The existence of a conspiracy among the offenders can be clearly deduced or inferred from the manner they committed the killing, demonstrating a common criminal purpose and intent. There being a conspiracy, the individual acts of each participant is not considered because their liability is collective. The crime committed is murder, qualified by treachery. 1994 at about 9.30 in the evening, while Dino and Rafi were walking along Ped Padre Faura Street, Manila, Johnny hit them with a rock, injuring Dino at the back. Rafi approached Dino, but suddenly Bobby, Steve, Danny, and Noni surrounded the duo. Then Bobby stopped Dino. Steve, Danny, Noni, and Johnny kept on hitting Dino and Rafi with rocks. As a result, Dino died. Bobby, Steve, Danny, Nona, and Johnny were charged with homicide. Why are there a lot of people here? Is there a conspiracy in this case? Can the court appreciate the aggravating circumstances of night time and band? Answer. Yes, there is conspir conspiracy among the offenders as manifested by the considered actions against the victims, demonstrating a common felonious purpose of assaulting the victims. The existence of the conspiracy can be inferred or deduced from the manner the offender acted in commonly attacking Dino and Rafi with rocks, whereby demonstrating a unity of criminal design to inflict harm on their victims. 1996. Jose, Domingo, Manolo, and Fernando, armed with polos, at about 1 o'clock in the morning, robbed a house at a desolate place where Danilo, his wife, and three daughters were living. While the four were in the process of ransacking Danilo's house, Fernando, noticing that one of Danilo's daughters was trying to get away, ran after her and finally caught up with her in a ticket somewhat distant from the house. Fernando, before bringing back the daughter to the house, raped her first. Thereafter, the four carted away the belongings to the, of Danilo and his family. What crime did Jose, Domingo, Manolo, and Fernando commit? Explain. Suppose after the robbery, the four took turns in raping the three daughters of Danilo inside the latter's house, but before they left, they killed the whole family to prevent identification. What crime did the four commit? Explain. Under the facts of the case, what ag aggravating circumstances may be appreciated against the four? Answer. Letter A. Jose, Domingo, and Manolo committed robbery, while Fernando committed complex crime of robbery with rape. Conspiracy can be inferred from the manner the offenders committed the robbery, but the rape was committed by Fernando at a place distant from the house, where the robbery 
was committed, not in the presence of the other conspirators. Hence, Fernando alone should answer for the rape, rendering him liable for the special complex crime, People v. Canturia et al. The crime would be robbery with homicide, implied there is still conspiracy. 1997. A had a grudge against F, deciding to kill F and his friends B and C, and D armed himself with knives and proceeded to the house of F, taking a taxi cab for the purpose. About 20 meters from their destination, the group alighted and after instructing E, the driver, to wait, traveled on foot to the house of F. B positioned himself at a distance at the group's lookout. C and D stood guard outside the house. Before A could enter the house, D left the scene without the knowledge of the others. He stealthily entered the house and stabbed F. F ran to the street but was blocked by C, forcing him to flee towards another direction. Immediately after A had stabbed F, A also stabbed G, who was visiting F. Thereafter, a exited from the house and together with B and C returned to the waiting taxicab and motored away. G died. F survived. Who are liable for the death of G and the physical injuries of F? A alone should be held liable for the death of G. The object of the conspiracy of A, B, and C and D was to kill F only. Since B, C, and D did not know of the stabbing of G by A, they cannot be held criminally, therefore. E, the driver, cannot be also held liable for the death of G, since the born one was completely unaware of said killing. For the physical injuries of F, A, B, and C should be held liable thereafter. Even if it was only A who actually stopped and caused physical injuries to G, B, and C are nonetheless liable for conspiring with A for contributing positive acts which led to the realization of a common criminal intent. B positioned himself as a lookout while C blocked F escape. D, however, altogether part of the conspiracy cannot be held liable because he left the scene without a could enter the house where the stabbing occurred although he was earlier part of the conspiracy he did not personally participate in the execution of the crime by acts which directly tended toward the same end in the same breath E, the driver, cannot also be held liable for the infliction of physical injuries upon F because there is no showing that he had knowledge of the plan to kill F 1998, Juan and Arturo devised a plan to murder Joel in a narrow alley near Joel's house. Juan will hide behind the big lump's paws and shoot Joel when the latter passes through on his way to work. Arturo will come from the other end of the alley and simultaneously shoot Joel from behind. On the appointed day, Arturo was apprehended by the authorities before reaching the alley. When Juan shot, shot Joel as planned, and he was unaware that Arturo was arrested earlier, discussed the criminal liability of Arturo. Arturo being one of the two who devised the plan to murder Joel, thereby becomes a co-principal by direct conspiracy. What is needed only is an overt act, and both will incur criminal liability. Arturo's liability as a conspirator arose from his participation in jointly devising the criminal plan with Juan to kill Jose, and it was pursuant to that conspiracy that Juan killed Joel. The conspiracy here is actual, not by inference only. The overt act was done pursuant to that conspiracy, whereof Arturo is co-conspirator. There being conspiracy, the act of one is the act of all. Arturo, therefore, should be liable as co-conspirator, but the penalty on him may be that of an accomplice only. People versus Nira. People versus Medrano. Because he was not able to actually participate in the shooting of Joel, having been apprehended before reaching the place where the crime was committed. Alternative answer. Arturo is not liable because he was not able to participate in the killing of Joel. Conspiracy itself is not punishable unless expressly provided by law, and this is not true in the case of murder. 2003. Implied Conspiracy. State the concept of implied conspiracy and give its legal effects. An implied conspiracy is one which is only inferred or deduced from the manner the participants in the commission of crime carried out its execution, where the offenders acted in concert in the commission of the crime, meaning that their acts are coordinated or synchronized in a way indicated, indicative that they are pursuing a common criminal objective. They shall be deemed to be acting in conspiracy and their criminal liability shall be collective, not individual. The legal effect of an implied com conspiracy are not all those who are present at the scene of the crime will be considered conspirators. Only those who participated by criminal acts in the commission of the crime will be considered as co-conspirators. In mere acquiescence 
to or approval of the commission of the crime without any act or criminal participation shall not render one criminally liable as co-conspirator. Justifying circumstances, defense of relative, Boybala was a notorious gang leader who had previously killed a policeman. The chief of police ordered his vice squad, headed by Captain Anisero, to arrest Boybala and should he resist arrest, to shoot and kill him. Acting upon an informer's tip, Anisero and two of his trusted men went to the Corinthian nightclub where they saw Boybala dancing with a hostess. Without any warning, Aniseto shot Boybala, who slumped on the dance floor. As Aniseto aimed another shot by Boy at Boybala, the brother of the latter, Pedro, who was seated at the table nearby, got hold of the table knife and stopped Aniseto, killing him. Instantly, the chief of police filed a homicide case against Pedro for the death of Aniseto. On the other hand, Pedro filed a complaint for murder against the chief of police for the death of Boybala, alleging that the issuance of the shoot-to-kill order was illegal and the chief of police was liable as a principal for inducement. How tenable are the respective claims of the chief of police and Pedro? The charge for murder against the chief of police for the death of Boybala is not tenable. Although the chief of police is the superior of Captain Aniceto, who shot Boybala in cold blood, he cannot be held accountable for the act of Aniceto. His order was specific to arrest Boybala and shoot and should he resist arrest to shoot and kill him. Aniceto did not act in compliance with his order. He shot Boybala without more without even attempting to make an arrest. Consequently, it could not be said that the killing of Bala by Aniceto was induced by the chief of police so as to make the latter criminally liable as a co-principal by inducement. The liability of the death of Bala is individual and not collective. On the other hand, the charge of homicide against Pedro for the stabbing of Aniceto is likewise not tenable. Pedro acted in legitimate defense of relative, he being the brother of Boy Bala. All the requisites of his justifying circumstance are present. Thus, there was unlawful aggression at the time that Pedro stabbed Aniceto. The latter had already shot at Boybala and was in the act of shooting him for the second time. The aggression is unlawful, although Aniceto is a police officer and Boybala is a notorious gangster. By shooting Boybala without warning instead of attempting to arrest him first, Aniceto became an unlawful aggressor. There was reasonable necessity of the means employed by Pedro to prevent or repel unlawful aggression. The use of a knife against a gun for defense is reasonable. Assuming that Boybala had provoked that attack on his person by Aniceto because of his having earlier killed a policeman, it does not appear that Pedro, the only one making the defense, had taken any part in said provocation.